like to remind my American friends that when you go to Baptist churches in Africa and in Brazil, expect the things that they think Baptists should not do, such as rocking in the house of God, such as speaking in tongues in the house of God, to the extent of prophecy in a Baptist church, it takes pastors like Reverend Dr. Fred David to make that happen <laughs> in a church like that. And I can tell you, it is the reason we see churches in some of these places dying. The freedom to worship. The freedom to expect God to do extraordinary things. The freedom that allows us to testify, as Carl was sharing, to the goodness of God in the daily life, what we may even consider mundane in our day-to-day -day life. God is good and deserves all the worship and praise. Amen. Amen. I could not start without telling you any time I mount this pulpit how humble I feel, how privileged I feel to be able to stand in the pulpit of this great man. I came to know him some 28 years ago, 1994 to be precise. Don't ask us how old we were then because we don't want to tell you. And I've observed him being consistent. Consistent in his preaching, consistent in his service, and even increasing his contribution to both national and international affairs of the church. Doc, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Calvary Baptist, you may have no idea who you have. But I think I have known him longer than some of you in this room. And so I can testify to what I've known him to be. I was a small boy. The first match for Jesus in Accra. And he was already a big shot in town. And they allowed a small boy to serve by their side to make things happen. And that small boy is now having the privilege to speak from his pulpit. I also want to say something briefly for those here and those at, at Arabraka. You may realize that the senior pastor has not spoken from the pulpit for quite some time now. He's supposed to be the one speaking today. He decided to offer his slot to me. That is inconceivable. For that, Doc, I am grateful. I am grateful that you allow this to happen. Now, on the subject that we have for us today, the subject is ability and attitude of giving. Ability and attitude of giving. Think about this. If God has called human beings to do one thing, and one thing alone, to glorify his name. Is it not the call to stewardship to be able to manage cosmic and global material, physical resources and use them in every way to glorify him? If we were to go to the very, very early stages of Genesis, is it not the mandate that God gave to humanity to manage the world? But is it not sin that brought us into that place where we began to believe that perhaps acquiring, possessing, holding on to, Thinking about self rather becomes 
that which satisfied, only to realize that actually they yield emptiness. They yield all kinds of things we do not want to experience. I pray that God speaks to us today. I pray that God clarifies his word to us today, to those in this room, those at Adabraka, those joining online, that God will speak to us at the very point of our needs. God would convict. God will help us to imbibe and embody the message that he has for us today, that we would embrace it in the fullness of its power that we will live to flourish and to glorify him in every part of our lives for his name's sake. Amen. Amen. You know, when we talk about giving, many people don't want to talk about giving. Especially if you're a Baptist pastor. You know the reason why? Just before I flew here, I was at a conference at Worcester with top 100 Christian leaders in New England. That is about five states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont. We were together at Worcester. About 70% of the leadership team were Baptist or Baptist leaders. And one of the things that we all acknowledge in our side talks was that in the Baptist church, we are able to give to projects. And we also seem to have some of the people that God blesses in society. We seem to have people who make decisions that change sectors. And yet, a Baptist minister is likely to resign from ministry because they are not paid well. People who serve in Baptist churches are not acknowledged and appreciated. I am not here to chastise you. I am here to share with you what I consider to be a calling. That is why I am passionate to talk about this subject. Some of us are called with the gift of giving and generosity. All of us have the mandate to live a flourishing life that includes generosity. Somebody like me, I don't have a lot. But I tell you something. I lack nothing. Because I've seen myself in the crossroad of God's call where God will always put me in front of a need I have recognized and bring me to someone who can supply the need. I like to call myself the pipeline in the house of God. I am supposed to distribute the water. I am supposed to open the vault from that side so that the water can come from God to distribute to the source. And I tell myself I dare not clog the water. It will spoil, it will be harmful, it will contaminate, and it will affect so many people. Why am I beginning this subject at this stage? I'm glad you asked that question. Because I am asked to talk about ability and attitude of giving. For ability, we speak about being able, capable. And I think everybody is able to give. In fact, everybody is born to give. I actually think that everybody will be satisfied if they learn to give. Not just giving money, giving of self. Giving of time. Giving of something that costs you. That makes a difference in somebody's life. And being able to be on the receiving end of actually enjoying seeing other people flourish because of your stewardship. When we talk about attitude, 
Attitude denotes character, mindset, belief, outlook. By attitude, we are talking about the mindset that makes us choose to do certain things or not do certain things. Friends, I had my dear brother and friend read the scriptures, two scriptures. You may ask why. The first is about Cain, which is our central uh, passage today. But I started to add another one. Because this subject is something I am very, very interested in. I am a village champion. You have heard me say several times from this pulpit. I'm a village boy. I am one of those accounts who was raised in the voter region. And I like to describe myself as more voterian than I can. I have been trying to make peace between the voterians and the Akans when the Akan boy falls in love with the Ewes all this time. I hope one day those unnecessary confusion will stop in the house of God. And they will understand how Christ transcends all. Amen. But God has chosen at every given stage to identify someone who sees something in me, who gives something, take me to one level, just so that I can be a faithful steward in what God has entrusted to my care. Cain was the first son in the Bible. Do you know that? Have you realized that? Do you notice that? He's the first son of all the privileges that was available. He was not born in a village. He did not lack anything. Jabez was born in pain. Circumstances in which Jabez was born was something that will come to be identified with his name. The one born in the privilege being a poor steward will actually end up causing more trouble. The one who was born when the mother had to experience a lot of pain and who was going to bear a name that denotes pain will actually going to be the one who will be honorable. Let's think about this. Today I am trying to suggest a few things to you. I am suggesting three things to you. One, there are things beyond your control. Two, there are things within your control. Three, there are things only God can do. Now, if you do not do the things beyond your control, you may not have the audacity to ask God for the things that only God can do. Because this is how the divine plan works. Let's take a look at one thing, what I call things beyond your control. The plight of Jabez and Cain. They were all named, if you look at the test. We are told that they were named. So one is named Jabez. The other is named Cain. These guys were named. Name meant something back then, as it means to us in Africa. In America, I tell my friends, in America we take name for granted. Somebody's name is called Saf. Because the, the last name is West. Is that right? North. Our children remind me, it's North. The other father's name, so that the, the child will be called Northwest. For fun. Name carries identity. Names carry reputation. Names carries essence. Your name has something linked to who you become. Whenever people mention your name, they make pronouncement of who you are and the potential with which you could become. 
Cain was named possession. Cain was named the right name. Cain had the right spot. Cain was in the right place. Jabez was named Jabez because his mother bore him in pain. Two things may be happening with Jabez. It is possible that the mother wanted people to remember that she bore him in pain and maybe God intervened. But without knowing the history, anytime you call him Jabez, you are talking the person who brought pain. Who wants to be friends with that person? Friends, I am here to suggest to you Some of you were born in the right place. Some of you were born with all the resources you needed. Some were born in not so right place. So many right people were born and raised in what looks like the wrong place. I tell my students who may be able to work and make money up to four to five hundred dollars a week as students that when they make that money That is twice, thrice, sometimes five times the salary of some people in other countries. Some tell me they are poor, but they have cars. I tell them, if you you have a car in my classroom, you are not poor. You belong to the 1% of the world. Some right people are born in in the right place. Some are born in the wrong place. Today, I have two choices before you to think, whatever your situation is. And I came to tell you that many challenges will be beyond your control, such as the circumstances in which you were born, and such as the things that are available to you to be raised to become who God wants you to be. Some of you are privileged to be just raised in some mansions. Some of us know what it means to make in coffee. You know in coffee? Yes, I know how to make in coffee. Some of us know how to weed. And if you strike too hard and you cut the plant, the cutlass lands on your feet. I have scars to prove it. But some not so. It doesn't matter where you start. I came to tell you that you may have the right name and you may have the right job. You may not have the right name and you may not have the right job. What matters is your disposition, where your posture will be when you stand before God. I came to tell you, it is not too late if you think you were born and raised in the wrong place to quit the victim's mentality And begin to think about what is possible with God. Too many people like to refer to family reputation. As the reason if they make 10 Ghana cities, they need to keep all. If you know where I was raised and how poor we are, then you will not ask me to give some of my money. Oh, the principle of generosity is the other way around. You give 30% away and see what the one who gave you has in store. My life is like this and I enjoy it. Sometimes I have next to nothing in my wallet but I have lacked nothing by the grace of God. I tell myself as long as I am a faithful distributor I will be where God wants me to be. You know, the next thing I want to touch on quickly is the posture of Jabez and Cain. And that is what was within their control. In the case of Cain, he was to make an offering with his brother. Notice that in those both tests, they were named and they were compared to their brothers. In the case of Cain, they made an offering. God acknowledges and receives that of his brother. Cain, 
Who wants things for himself? Who wants to possess things? For some reason, began to be envy. Do you, do you actually realize that people who don't want to give, one of the things they like to do is they want to hoard. And they also like to envy people who are doing well. And they keep asking, oh, why, why are people doing well and not me? Well, you have no space to keep it. The pipe is clogged. The pipe is clogged. So God wants to give you 200 Ghana notes. You have clogged the pipes with Ghana. <laughs> One Ghana denominations. Empty the clock. Empty the clock so that he can feel it. Cain had this big issue and will kill his brother. Very sad. But let me tell you something about Jabez. Jabez did not start well. But the Bible says in comparison to his brother, brothers, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. Two quick things about honor. There is what we call ascribed honor. Ascribed honor is given by birth. By status. By conferring. So if we, you were born in a royal family, you may call yourself Nana. But there is something we call acquired honor. That is what you get when you earn it. You do things, you serve and all that and you become honorable for that. Jabez is from the tribe of Judah. And so they are all honorable. His brothers were honorable. But Jabez was more honorable. As, much, as far as what was within his control was concerned, Jabez set himself apart. He did what he is supposed to do to live an honorary life. Normally, in the tradition of the Hebrew people, honorable people observe three things. One is arms giving. Arms giving. They help the poor and the marginalized among them. Two is fasting. Three is prayer. Honorable people give and by virtue of what they do, people see their essence to the community. Am I speaking to somebody in Calvary Baptist Church? Are you mad? The senior pastor should have spoken. He wouldn't have said things like this. <laughs> Friends, I suggest to you five postures. As we think about what is within our control. We can think with victimhood. Vindictiveness like Cain. And wallow in self-pity, blame, hate those who are doing well. Envy them and clog our channels of success with what is unimportant. Or two, we can also imbibe and get ourselves in self-seeking. Do you know it is in the same passage Cain asked God, am I my brother's keeper? Who cares about the brother I just killed? Really? Yeah. He asked God, am I my brother's keeper? I am thinking about myself. We can adopt that posture. We can also adopt the posture of what I call ratification. Like Jabez, you say, my name is associated with pain. Okay, so I will take it. I'm going to cause pain to everybody I see. So that people will know that, of course, my name is Jabez. Or we can also choose what I call alteration. Where you say, no matter my circumstances, I am prepared for a change. No matter where God started me from, I am ready to build on. No matter what I see around me that looks like success, God may have more in store for me. 
No matter what God has put within my range or within my jurisdiction to manage, maybe God has more things for me to manage and begin to alter my life, begin to embrace what God has for me, begin to accept what God has to say about my life and begin to position myself in a way that God will be glorified. Jabez will not let the pain of his mother determine his destiny. Unlike Cain, he kept his focus on God, his faithfulness, his service to God and humanity, and he was just doing what was right. Change begins with you, and it is within your power. My dear brothers and sisters, I can tell you more and more because this is, passage, this is the kind of thing I love to talk about giving. You see, when you live that life, it's a lot of fun. I come to Ghana and I see some big, big people. And they say, do you remember? I say, I remember. They are big men and big women. And I still look like I am broke. But you know what? I am so happy. I am so fulfilled. I'm just doing what God wants me to do. Three quickly. The prayer of Jabez. Like Cain, if you kill your brother for not being willing to offer what was necessary or what you could or what was within your control, you are likely to cause harm to other people around you. But for Jabez, because he had done what was within his power, he had the audacity to pray the prayer of Jabez. Friends, I like to tell people we want to pray the prayer of Jabez. You need to position yourself at the place where you have earned that right. When you say, God, I have been where you want me to be and I am doing what you have called me to do and I am being the instrument, the channel that is bringing glory to you and I can testify and say, because of this, God, I come before you. Please bless me indeed. And it will not sound like arrogance. God, enlarge my territory. You know what that means? It could be God enlarge my physical space or it could be like where my brother is in GCB. Maybe God is saying to enlarge your space means to enlarge your circle of influence. You can have the audacity to pray that prayer expecting God will hear and answer because you stand where God wants you to be. He said, God, when you do that, I want you to keep me, protect and guide me. And by the way, unlike Cain, please help me not to cause pain. And what was the resource? And God granted his request. Wow! God, for God to grant his request means God blessed him indeed. God enlarged his territory. God kept him. And God kept him from causing pain to others. Do you know that in Calvary Baptist Church, here at Shiashi and Adabraka and those following online, if I get a thousand people who will tell themselves, for every week they will discipline themselves and use less data and add 10 Ghana cities, to their giving at church. Money they could use to spend more data surfing on the internet to doing things they are not supposed to do sometimes. If I get 1,000 people to do that, Calvary Baptist will have 10,000 Ghana cities extra for the pastors to identify and to use to those in need of help. If some of us just stop drinking three of the sodas we like to drink per week, three Ghana cities each, that would be nine Ghana cities each. If I only get 
a church that is more than 2,000 people, if only 1,000 people do that, Pastor, you should see 9,000 added to the income every week. We said tithes. Do you know that it's a global phenomenon that most people give tithes not for their tithes. But they give tithes as a symbolic gesture. They give something to fill the place of tithes because they don't want to give 10% of what they could give. If only 60% of this church will give their tithes to the church and expect, as Baptists like to do, and I know you do it very well here. I've known this man for a while. And I know that if you are not really putting pressure on him or all that, by this time you'll be complaining. None of you are complaining. You didn't even want him to retire. I know it. Because he's discharging his duty. If he's squandering money, you'll be complaining. Is, is that not true? Baptists know how to get to the fastest to do the stuff. But all this money will just come in. And then you can count on them to be the stewards of what God has called them to do. To identify those who need and help. You know, in Baptist churches, for example, if you pastor more than 500 congregations globally, the way you live with your family as a Baptist pastor will be far less in terms of how much church pays you than a Pentecostal charismatic church's pastor who has 150 congregations. And that congregation may not have half of the capacity the Baptist church has. Because the Pentecostal charismatic church, apart from what they call salary, on Sunday somebody is going to shake the senior pastor's hand and they will bless them. They say people who sweep in the church, they will bless them. They will identify people who need some things. They will just bless them. And so that giving and exchange of giving is not to just church. It extends to all those places and it goes that way. I know my time is up and I have to wrap up and I'm talking about giving and you don't want to hear more. True or false? <laughs> I am suggesting to you that we can choose to be Cain. Or we can choose to be jobbers. Giving and the attitude of giving is what is within our power. It is very, very easy for us to throw 20 Ghana City away somewhere. I want to challenge you to trust the stewards God has put in charge of Calvary Baptist. Test God with your giving. Challenge them with steward, stewardship. I tell you quickly a story about John Seville, a pastor, and our end. John Seville's story is told in this book, The Genius of Generosity, which was given to me uh, just at a conference at Worcester, just before I came here, and I have not stopped going back and forth with this. John was in a church in the Dallas area, a church like our church, the Baptist church, and he called a new pastor, and the new pastor has heard that he's fairly rich. So when he called him, he thought, oh, this is the guy who wants to control me because he gives a lot of money. And John sat down with, with the pastor and told him that there are so many people who need help in the area. So he's going to give him $5,000. His job is to go and identify those who need help from those on the street to those who need help in the church, he should make effort to know those who need help and give the money. And the pastor said that's the first time he had been given such a summit. He worked so hard, but then he realized as he gave, he had a lot of joy. In this book, The Genius of Generosity, Chip writes that every month, he will meet with him and they will share a story about how many people are being helped. And he could see how John is excited. And he is also excited. They felt like they have a new mission. They have a pact 
to work as instruments of God. And John will increase the money. And John kept increasing the money to the point that he sit down and ask, how am I going to identify people who need help and help them? John says, go and find them. And they kept doing this and helping people and many people being helped. And he writes this book to share that in fact, he noticed the genius of generosity is that people become more fulfilled. People feel like they are giving more as they give. The people feel they are more blessed. They have joy. They have less anxiety. They have less fear of who is going to steal their resources. God takes charge of them all. I want to suggest to you, ability and attitude towards giving is within your power. But my prayer and my aim is this, my dear friends, that one day we can have the audacity after we have expressed that ability and attitude to stand before God and say, God, I have done all my parts. So now bless me indeed. Bless me more. Bless me with more resources. I want to give to the church. I want to give to people in the church. It doesn't only have to come to the offering basket. People who need help in the church. These pastors do extraordinary things. One day Pastor Kinsley told me something he was about to do. I sat down there and I nearly wept. And I told him, Kinsley, I want to be part of this. Let's help those people. Because God did not put them on our path for nothing. And it is within our path. I mean, some of you have the ability to give 10,000 Ghana cities. But you may still choose to give 1,000. Don't clog the pipeline with one city denominations. When God is saying, clear it out and let me fill it with 200. He's looking for faithful stewards to count on and to work with. Are we willing? Are we willing? I leave the, the rest with Reverend Doctor. The book, at the end of the book, the author lists some important key things people should know if you really want to enjoy, enjoy the blessings that comes with generosity. I am Dako. I am not the son of Comrade Dako. I know Comrade Dako very well. I call him my old man, and I like to tell him if there is any inheritance, though I am not a family member, I like to have my share. <laughs> that we have not settled yet. <laughs> but that was the man whose success was rooted in his ability to even tithe on loans from banks before he invested in his pottery farm. His whole life is giving. And when he talks about giving, he doesn't want to keep, stop talking. May God help us to be faithful stewards in his hands. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we are thankful to you today. I pray that this being a message we normally would not like to hear. May you stir our hearts. May you stir our minds. May you refresh those of us who are already engaged, generously giving, left and right. May you help us to experience the blessings, the joy, the fulfillment that comes with it. May those who are reluctant and afraid step into the future you have for us in the spirit of generosity. May we experience all that you have for us as stewards of the resources you have given us. And may you grant the leadership of this church the grace to be faithful stewards in what comes in to help those who need help among us. We are counting on your grace and your power. And I pray you be a blessing as we become channels of your blessing to many others. Amen. Amen. Before I sit down, don't clap yet. Before I sit down, can you put on the screen? I am killing Carl's time. Carl is behind me. I know. I'm pretending I have not seen. And uh, can you put on the screen first, first, uh, Second Corinthians? 
That Second Corinthians passage there. Shall we all stand? Please join me. And let's read that Second Corinthians passage together. And I'll give the microphone to Carl. Second Corinthians 9, verse 6. We'll read together to verse 15. Shall we start together? Remember this. 